Toronto millennials want to be homeowners, but only less than a quarter think they can. That's the first article we're going to be going through and kind of parse through the buyer sentiment of where, you know, I guess our generation is, the millennials. Then the next article we got here is, where is Toronto real estate headed this fall? I talked about it last video. I put a link up here, um, but they're kind of mixing in some of the economists and, you know, real estate experts to kind of talk about where they think and I'll provide my feedback on top of that. And then we got the last article here, which is Powell. This is the head honcho of the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is the same person equivalent as Tiff Macklem at Bank of Canada. But I'll go into more of that later. But basically is signaling that there's going to be more pain to bring down inflation and how this is going to impact the Toronto real estate market. So all of that I'm going to be covering in this week's reaction video. And if you're looking for some help to kind of get ready to gear up for the fall market that you'll probably see some activity starting after labor day till about like a week or two after thanksgiving long weekend you can book a call with me using the link that's on the screen it's right here it's www.chatwithzen.com simply click on the date and a time that works best for you and then when you see the prop fill in your name email mobile phone number and the question you have for me and then we'll chat then Good day, Toronto. Welcome to another episode of Prime Properties TV. My name is Zen and I own and operate a Remax in the greater Toronto area. And thank you all for subscribing and liking and congratulating me on hitting 10,000 subscribers. Uh, it's actually kind of cool to see that like five figure extra comma. It's quite an achievement. I haven't really felt something like that in a while. So I do appreciate everyone for uh, liking and subscribing to all this. So much thank you. The ironic thing is I actually posted the wrong video for the video that hit 10,000. So that's life for you. Funny things. <laughs> Anyways, the first article I got here is Toronto millennials want to be homeowners, but only 22% believe they can actually do it. Now, this is a survey. Now, I read this article already. Obviously, I've highlighted some things, but here's my issue of all these again. If you only interview 2,000 people, you really have to pick the right sample size because you want to see where these people are, where they are in their careers and everything, right? And I don't think 2,000 people is sufficient. So that's my first gripe with this, but this does give us a little bit of like an idea of where the sentiment is for millennials, which I think is like 25 to like 40. Yeah, something like that. So they're saying here that three quarters or 75% of millennials saying home ownership is important to them, but less than a quarter of them believe that they can actually get one in the city. So this is basically saying, uh, you know, three out of four people think ownership is important, but only one of those four people actually think they can actually achieve it, right? And like I was saying earlier, they asked 2,003 millennials here between 26 and 41. I would like to see at least 5,000, but you know, that's just a science dude in me, right? So let's just uh, continue scrolling down here. Here's where it gets interesting, right? So I'll read it for you. Despite recent drops due to higher interest rates, the average price to own a single detached family home in Toronto remains well above one and a half million according to most you know, MLS indexes. Again, I don't like using indexes, but the purpose is it's there, right? And they're saying that the average apartment is about 780 and the rents across everything in Toronto is 2100. So that's kind of on point of like what the cost of living is going to be in Toronto. So either way, it's very expensive. So that's why you have a lot of people kind of moving into different areas. Right. So I think they go on to talk about here where a lot of millennials are moving out, especially during the pandemic. If you know, you're tech savvy and you can work remotely, you can just buy a uh, different like, you know, home elsewhere where it's like half the price and you have a better lifestyle there. Right. So that's why a lot of people are opting for that. But it really just depends on which millennial you're talking about. Right. Because one of the things that people always overly focus on kind of like numbers and stuff like they don't understand the emotional side when it comes to transacting. Right. So like a lot of people don't want to leave the city because your family and friends are there. It's very hard to lift your roots up and move somewhere else, especially like if you have kids, you know, that are young in public school, you basically just like evacuated and, you know, you have to remake all the friends, which tends to be hard for kids. Right. So these are all like emotional sides where you have to look at both sides of the coins and not just the number because everyone's just way too focused on timing the market and what it is or like greedy landlords or, you know, prices, they blame people, whatever. Right. Don't want to get into that. But here's kind of an interesting thing. Right. So this is like a real estate agent saying that in today's society, especially in Canada, when you buy a home, you've made it. This is a stigma that I'm going to try to debunk on next episode, which is Thursday. Right. And it's a very Canadian thing to say, kind of like I jokingly say, like, you know, it's not patriotic unless, you know, you take out a line of credit on your home to buy another investment property. Right. These are all jokes. But, you know, to have that kind of zeitgeist in the, uh, you know, millennials mindset, it really puts a lot of stress on them. And there's nothing wrong with renting. And I've actually rented for a long time before I bought something and there was no issues with that. And I'll go more into that on Thursday's episode. But we need to like 
distance ourselves from actually renting. Because I know a lot of millennials who are renting now and they rent in the most expensive properties in Toronto because that's expensive, but they buy investment properties elsewhere so that they're, you know, going on both sides and owning real estate, but they're owning profitable real estate as opposed to buying something in the city that's so much more expensive, right? And as you know, I'm a proponent of cash flow. It's really hard to make things cash flow in the city. So they go outside of the city to get cash flow. So that actually makes total sense. And we need to, you know, step away from the stigma of that. Now, the interesting thing that I've highlighted here is there's a lot of people still saying this, right? You know, about like wanting a home ownership. It doesn't make much sense throwing money away every single month if you can put it down on a mortgage. Look, if you, we were buying stuff at like 2% interest where um, your mortgage payment, 65% of it was going towards principal, sure, yeah, I can see why. But at the current interest rate of 5%, if you buy something on average right now, and again, I'll do the math on Thursday's episode, so like and subscribe, <laughs> you're gonna basically have a point where the interest you're paying is equal to that of the um, int- uh, the rent that you're paying in the city, right? So on top of that, if you're you know entry level home, you have to pay condos, condo fees, not condos, that's condo fees, uh, property taxes, insurance a little bit higher than like tenant insurance, and any kind of you know uh, maintenance upkeep if you have some on your property, but it's all on the older side, right? So your cost of living generally isn't factored, and people don't look into those numbers. So while I'm a big proponent of owning real estate because it provides you security and you can leverage that to get into uh, more real estate, which helps you grow wealth. It's not the end all be all for everybody. So the idea of having ownership to make it and that, you know, throwing money away, renting is throwing money away is not correct. It, it, It really isn't. And I will debunk that on Thursday's episode. Now, obviously, if you like this kind of content, do me a favor, like this so that it goes out to everywhere. A lot more people kind of spread it. And again, thank you everyone for subscribing to hit the 10,000 mark. And we'll try to get even more, right? We're going to grow the channel a little bit more, try to provide more value to you. And if any of you guys have any kind of ideas you want me to kind of talk about or anything in manner of like real estate, I'm more than happy to add some more content to it to kind of provide some more value for all of you. And again, if you're looking for some help to kind of navigate the real estate market, you can book a strategy call with me right here. It's www.chatwoodzen.com. All right, let's move to the next article here. So we've got, where is Toronto real estate headed this fall? Talked about that on th- uh, last Thursday's episode. You can check it out here. And they're saying economists say prices to drop by 24%, right? I think that was like the Desjardins article. So maybe they're like, like mushing the two, right? So a couple of things I kind of highlighted here. So it says, we were waiting for prices to come down. This is um, would-be buyer, right? And I know it won't be the dream home, but at least it's something, right? And this is kind of, a lot of the mindset I've been talking to with a lot of people who booked a call with me, right? It's just about, hey, you know, is it a good timing to get in the market? And that always obviously depends on, you know, where you are in life and what you're trying to look for, right? But there are, at least from my perspective, a lot more buyers than there are sellers coming onto the market. And it's just this idea of, you know, we're kind of stabilizing, prices are at the point right now where, you know, they're the same monthly cost, you're buying for lower and your down payment is a little bit less, but, you're not competing with a lot of people. So if we do see a lot of good inventory come out in September, which tends to be the case, I think there's going to be some of it getting absorbed. I don't think we're going to see multiple offers or anything, but it's going to be much better than the July and August numbers that we have seen in the last two months, right? So that's kind of where um, a lot of my perspective is coming from and talking to a lot of people because you got to remember, uh, any good real estate agent that doesn't volume will know kind of the boots on the ground idea and anecdotal stuff that happens before it gets to the numbers and the sales, right? Because, you know, us as realtors have to transact for us before we get to the sales and the numbers, right? Um, so they got some charts here showing you kind of the average price of a GTA home right now. So you can see it peaked in February and it's been coming down. So this is kind of what I've been saying to a lot of people, all right? We're gonna probably see a little uptick like this in September, and then we'll probably continue trending back down depending on how interest rates go, right? Like September 7th, we'll probably get another one. And whether or not we get one in October is TBD depending on inflation. And most of the, t- uh, there's no announcement on November and most of the time with rate hikes, no one does, does it in December. But I will say that this is a rather weird and unnormal year. So I wouldn't be surprised if we get one, but it just really depends on how this kind of like data comes out in the fall, right? So as with kind of like uh, sales, we're at 4,900, which is uh, really, 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 really low. Like uh, I think 
22 year low, that was, that was the exact number. We're probably like coming down a little bit right now on the uh, kind of sales side in August. I tr I'm gonna show you a little bit. And then we'll probably pick back up seasonally because it's uh, September. I don't know why this is not working. Yeah, we're gonna pick back up seasonally. And I, can t I suspect October will be decent relative to July and August, but it will still be below the 10 year average and it will continue trending back down in December. That's generally what my gut feeling tells me, right? So if I, uh, look at the data over here. So this is data that's pulled effective uh, Monday, right? You can see a lot of the areas I highlighted in yellow. You can see the average price, like I was showing you last video, has actually gone up. But you have to remember, like, there's not many sales, so this is kind of a little bit skewed. Um, so we're going to have less sales than we had in July, but this is going to probably be the least amount of sales we'll have probably for the next, maybe, I don't know, like three to four months or so until like December, because uh, we're going to see that fall market uh, spring back up. There's a pun there somewhere. I, I, I don't know, but it's just in my mind. There's a pun there somewhere. And I'm going to point out one thing because I was looking at this data for you. Again, we're looking at King City all over again. You can see there's a 283% price increase. Look at your data carefully when you're scanning through things. Because again, I think there's a $12 million home in rural King that actually sold. And there's 18 sales. That's most definitely going to skew the average way, way, way up. Okay. Now, um, I highlighted a couple other things I want to comment on in regard to these kind of economists. So they say here, with the housing market continue to take a hit from the rates, rate hikes, uh, some economists predict home prices are likely to continue to decline until end of 2023. In some predictions, the average price of Canadian home could lose almost a quarter of its value. So remember, they're talking about Canadian homes. If I had to translate that into the GTA, for whatever reason, GTA um, is a little bit more like Ford looking. And I don't know, maybe because people are smarter or maybe just because we have more leverage. It's too hard to say. But uh, we're down about like 20% from end of July. We'll probably be up a little bit. So it'll be like, you know, taking us out of a crash from the peak or something, right? Depending on how you look at your numbers. Um, but what I do think here is even if they continue to decline in the end of 2023, I don't think they're going to decline at such a rapid rate because you get a shock from the interest rate, right? So even if we're to bring ourselves back to the neutral rate, which is like three and a quarter, I think that's what it said, we just need another uh, 75 bips to get there. And I think we'll probably get there in September. So that's why I think the magnitude and the velocity of the um, decreases is probably going to slow down a little bit, at least in Toronto, right? Or like GTA. And um, we got here saying that they expect a seasonal uptick that typically takes place. Correct. It'll be mild this year. And I agree with that because we have to adjust the rate hikes and how some people may perceive the September 7th rate hike. So that's all correct. I completely agree with that. And here's kind of where I will say um, things could get dicey and no one will understand, right? Because when you talk about the economy, like just because uh, we're going to a recession, a lot of people are talking about how, oh, in a recession, they're going to cut rates. The most important thing, people always don't remember these things are like maybe they haven't studied history or you know maybe they're young, really, really young, right? If there are motivated sellers who are forced to sell due to a job loss or wage cuts, that's going to be a predominant reason why prices are going to fall. So if we do go into recession, jobs start getting cut, like labor forces start getting cut, we're going to see that a lot, right? So if, I'll give you an example. So like GDP, real estate, a lot of it is in Canada. If builders stop building, there's a lot less trades that are going to be employed because they prefer the bigger contracts that people bid on, right? And when there's a shorter supply, prices go up. So I've noticed even right now, a lot of the trades that we talk to, there are a lot you know, more available to come out and give us quotes. They're not you know, doing another project because people are cutting back, right? Because of inflation and they're not spending as much money on like building a pool, building a deck, doing rentals to the house, right? So that part is gonna come back down. And then when the real estate also slows down, you got real estate agents who are gonna not be making much money, right? So unless you're um, established enough or you have a lot of transactions or you know some money build up, they're gonna feel it too, right? Because that applies to the economy and there's so many of us. And then you got the mortgage brokers on that side, right? Then you also got the real, um, not, uh, Real estate lawyers who do a transaction, but I suspect they'll still stay busy because of all the litigation that maybe happened. So there's a big kind of like rollover effect of like the economy slowing down, right? So if you're out of a job and you can't pay the mortgage, that is way, 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 way more difficult to kind of find replacement income than if you were to have to just like increase your income a little bit to, you know, match a trigger rate or, you know, to keep your home because rates went up on a variable, right? So that is what I think is going to basically cause a really, really steep drop if we go into a really steep recession and people can't sustain their properties, right? So if people need to kind of cut back, I may see some investors that aren't cash flowing, right? Because of higher rates or something, start selling their home, right? And that's when we see kind of a downward price discovery on like real estate prices. Uh, then we got to see 
We're starting to see more confidence in the fall, but it's the numbers that I typically see at the end of a correction. True, uh, getting a lot more activity and showings on listings right now, but that doesn't really mean much. It's just like people are kind of looking. I am still seeing a lot of properties that are like, instead of like, say it was like a million two property listed for 99, I'm seeing a lot of properties that are like 1.1 the end price, but they're being listed at like 699 and 799 and they're getting like five to six offers. It's really, really weird right now. And there's a lot of people actually putting offers and like five or six offers on average on some of these like nice staged homes, which is weird, right? Which is weird. Again, we'll see how some of this kind of pans out come September. And then the last thing I have here is, if there are more buyers and fewer listings, it could stabilize the prices as nicer homes will be snatched up quickly. Fully 100% agree with this because like I've been saying, the average price will tick up because the bigger detached homes that are well ready to go, turnkey, which a lot of people are looking to buy, will get snatched up. And like, let's just say an example in a market right now where like it's still a seller's market, but feels like a buyer's market. Let's say one in six homes sold. You still need to stand out for that property home. And I would say that you know, one in six home is going to be really good if people compete for it. But if they don't get uh, that home and they, look, they move to like, you know, the second place, so they know what? I don't actually want to buy the second place home because it's not ready. And because of the sentiment where the interest rates are kind of like, you know, going up, going down, or maybe they're comfortable where they are and they don't want that house, they're not as motivated to kind of buy that home. So that's why you want to be the best on the street, the best on your area, because those are still going to move. If you're second or third place, yeah, good luck because just because you're on the market doesn't mean a buyer has to buy right now unless they're highly motivated. And that's where the buyer sentiment comes in based on the interest rate, right? And then I got two more things here. Right now, this is talking about the person that was um, in the earlier article looking for a place. So it's similar to what I was just saying earlier, right? Him and his wife are saying that they're paying 7,500 and they're comfortable with their rental, which is the same amount that they're paying for the home. So that's why, unless it's that home that they you know, can see themselves living in, it doesn't make sense for them to pull the trigger and buy something, knowing that even though there's a seasonal uptick in price, if it's not the right home, they can wait because we are still on a slumping market due to interest rates. Like I said before, I don't think we can sustain these like 5% variables that are coming in September and something will have to give. But that duration in which something has to give is a probably medium term. It's not a short term, right? I was talking about seasonality is short term, like interest rates and stuff that filter through in 12 to 18 months is midterm. And then the long term uh, fundamentals are population growth and kind of um, scarcity of land, right? So you have to survive into that point or they could wait into that point where something becomes more attractive. That's why it's not very uh, motivating for buyers to be jumping in the market unless it's the home they absolutely want. And that's why if you're gonna sell, it needs to be wicked good. Right. Um, this part is just funny. Again, I'll dispel it um, Thursday. It's ridiculous to spend that amount of money on a first home, call it like a million bucks. Um, normally speaking, it's not the dollar that we keep of the home. It's what it is after inflation or the lack of um, valuation of the money. Right. So if you go down the rabbit hole of what money actually is, the dollar that we have is less and less sacred. So if you aren't um, putting into something that keeps its price, everything's eventually get more expensive, as you can see with inflation. Right. But I'm not going to get into that. And then we got the last article here. Powell warns of some pain ahead as the Fed's fight to bring down inflation. So uh, Jerome Powell, head of the Federal Reserve, which is the equivalent of the head of the Bank of Canada, Tiff Macklem, he sets the interest rates with the FOMC meeting. And he basically had a talk on Friday that basically set the market on fire. Everything went down. Um, and it's freaking a lot of people up because and I'll read it for you. While interest rates... While higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. And he basically goes on in this like really short speech that he expects to do that some more because his mandate is that he needs to bring inflation down. Now, even though central banks' mandates are dual mandate, which is bring down inflation and high employment, the employment is still really strong. And I would say that if we're seeing a rally in, say, the stock market or some other market, it means that you probably have more ability to bring the interest rates higher because there's like, you know, what they call a dead cat bounce or a seasonal bounce in September, right? So having them hear them say this, right? Um, they will have meetings in September, and I would not be surprised if, you know, Bank of Canada follows the, you know, Federal Reserve, and I've talked about it many times, we are basically the tail of the dog, then the dog is U.S., and, you know, Canada's economy is the size of California's, right? So if they increase their rates in September and there's more pressure because inflation is not coming back down, I would not be surprised if Canada has to increase their interest rates because of the currency and all of the big trading partner. So that's why I'm saying. Like, yes, we're going to see a seasonal uptick, but I would not be surprised until we kind of really see like rates stabilize. And when I say stabilize, I don't mean they're going to come back down. I just mean they're going to stay in the same place. Right. So a lot of damage can still be done in the real estate in a very slow death. 
Now, okay, I want to use death, like a very slow, painful way where we'll see like maybe one or 2% uh, depreciation year over year where prices don't jump up the way we normally see in Toronto, right? So that's why I'm saying, unless we start seeing rate cuts, it's very hard to see the market spring back to kind of where we were even call it like in, you know, late 2021 before the frenzy that was like uh, early 2022. So we need to see rate cuts to even get there. But if rates stay this way after the increases and stabilize, it's still some pain for a lot of people who hold assets because high rates mean lower asset prices, low rates mean higher asset prices in short, right? Hopefully this kind of gives you an idea of what's going on and you guys are enjoying the rest of your summer. If you are trying to get ready for the fall market and you want to transact, we can book a strategy call with me using the link right here. It's www.chatwithzen.com. And thanks again for the 10 subscribers. Thank you. Until next time, your move, your future. See ya. Now that you're done watching this one, how about this one? Oh, you know what? This one's good too. Ooh, this one's really good. You know what? Just watch them both.